All right, so we left off talking about convection cells, and um, as we discussed in class today, um, on, the on a local level, these convection cells are responsible for land and sea breezes. Um, on a global scale, however, these cells are called Hadley cells. So what you're looking at here um, is a large Hadley cell. So a large Hadley cell will begin its cycle over the equator here, where the warm, moist air evaporates and rises into the atmosphere. The precipitation in that region is one cause of the abundant equatorial rainforest. So all of this rising air and this precipitation right here creates the tropics. And in an area usually between about 10 north and 10 south is where you'll find most of the world's tropical rainforests. The cool, dry air then descends over here about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, forming the belts of deserts that are seen around the world in these, in these latitudes. 30 degrees north, you've got the Sahara. Okay, and if you look at the very little amount of land that there is in the southern hemisphere, uh, you'll see some desertification taking place around 30 degrees south latitude as well. Now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some global circulation. And when we start talking about these feral and polar cells, um, notice here is our Hadley cell right here. This ITCZ stands for Intertropical Convergence Zone. Which makes sense because we see air converging here at the equator and then it rises. Okay. But basically what we have is we've got here's 30 degrees north, and here's the end of this large Hadley cell. Then what we've got is we've got another cell, another convection cell that's taking place um, bordering right next to the Hadley cell. So we have an area of a surface high pressure here at 30 degrees north latitude. So we've got surface divergence here creating this cell. Okay, so the feral cell basically is kind of the opposite gear of a Hadley cell. So you've got winds exiting this high pressure area around 30 degrees north, heading back towards the equator and heading up towards the poles, which in turn, the poles have really, really cold air descending upon the poles, and then it goes towards this convergence area at 60 degrees north. 60 degrees north is another low pressure area. This is what's known as the polar front. The polar front in the northern hemisphere's wintertime is located um, near Alaska and the Pacific Northwest in the Pacific Ocean. This polar front, this area right here in our wintertime, is where most of our low pressure systems that travel from west to east across the country are generated. It's where they begin. So basically what we've got here is we've got a Hadley cell that is just this really big convection cell um, that's close to the equator. So the rising air is south at the equator, and then the sinking air is north at 30 degrees north. Okay. So we've got sinking here, and we've got sinking here. Surface divergence, surface divergence creates this high pressure. Here, surface convergence creates this low pressure. So this air is sinking, and then it warms as it goes across the land, and then it converges and rises again, okay? So here is cloud formation and lots of weather systems that are created here at the polar front. Here is cloud formation, lots of precipitation, and tropical rainforests that are created here. So really what you need to know for your AP exam is just how these convection currents interact with one another to be able to create a global circulation pattern. And this right here is the global circulation pattern. So we've got the equator right here. And as you can see, it says ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. So 
here are all of your cells. So this one would be a Hadley. This is a feral cell. And this is a polar cell. Okay, so here we've got the area of low pressure because we've got air rising. Here air is sinking. Notice the cactus right here. So you have the world's deserts right here along 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Then we've got air rising again here at the polar front. Okay, so this just shows global circulation patterns. What this creates now is, notice that we have air moving from north to south in this band. And I'm just going to focus on the northern hemisphere here. Remember what we talked about with regard to the Coriolis effect. Because of Coriolis, these winds are not going to go straight north-south. They're going to deflect to the right of their direction. Now, notice that they are moving more in an east-west pattern. Okay? These right here, these winds in this, in this belt in the northern hemisphere, are known as the northeast trade winds. They're the trade winds because these are the winds that Europeans caught to come from Europe over to the New World. Now, between 30 and 60 degrees north latitude, between here and here, notice the circulation is going from south to north. So, winds are going this way. As winds go this way, we'll see that Coriolis is going to cause these winds to deflect to the right. As they are deflected to the right, what you're creating now is these prevailing westerly winds. These west, the, again, westerlies and northeast trade winds, we describe winds, the direction from which they are traveling. So from west to east, they're called westerlies. From east to west, they're called easterlies. So what I would do is I would take a look at this diagram, see where your prevailing winds are from, and just be able to know that most of the world's deserts are going to be found here at around 30 degrees south latitude, 30 degrees north latitude. So definitely familiarize yourself with this. Where are most of the tropical rainforests found? Tropical rainforests are found near the equator in this intertropical convergence zone. Okay, and this will actually go a long way towards helping you remember which ecosystems and which biomes can be found in different locations. So we've got tropical rainforest here at the equator, and then you've got a tropical deciduous forest just north and just south of that. Then you've got deserts that are located at 30. Here is where you're going to have deciduous forest and grassland of a temperate climate. This is a temperate climate, deciduous forests and grasslands. Evergreen coniferous forests. Evergreen coniferous forests are going to be Mostly the northern hemisphere because there's more land there, not so much in the southern because there isn't much land that's close to the South Pole. But all of these things kind of go a long way with understanding why biomes are where they are. All right, let's talk about monsoons. Monsoons are seasonal winds that are usually accompanied by really heavy rainfall. Um, and they're caused by the fact that land heats up and cools down more quickly than water does. So in a monsoon, um, hot air rises from the heated land and a low pressure system is created. The rising air is quickly replaced by cooler moist air that blows in from over the ocean. As this air rises, it cools and the moisture it carries is released in a steady seasonal rainfall. Uh, this process happens in reverse in the dry season when masses of air have cooled over the land, uh, that have cooled over the land, blow out over the ocean. Okay. So basically what we've got here is the winter monsoon. We've got a localized high pressure where the winds are blowing from high to low. And then in the summer monsoon, the land heats up faster than the ocean does. So it creates this low pressure right here and winds blow from a high pressure, high pressure to low and it carries all of this moisture with it. All right, so winter right here, the ocean is warmer than the land. So it looks almost exactly like the land breeze and sea breeze 
that we diagrammed today. So the air descends over the land, cool, dry air goes out over the ocean where it rises up. During the summer, the land is warmer than the ocean, so you've got a localized low pressure here, air rises, warm, moist air comes here, and you get all of this rainfall. Rain shadow effect. The rain shadow effect is something that we wind up seeing um, very much in the 30 degree north and a little bit south area, uh, mostly where you've got, especially on the windward side of mountains, where you've got an ocean body and you have moist air that rises up the one side or the windward side of the mountain. It cools, and as it cools, that air, can, the water vapor condenses, and you get precipitation on the windward side. Then on the leeward side, that air is descending, and it's expanding. So what winds up happening is it expands, becomes really, really dry, and you get this rain shadow desert. A couple of examples. If you go back to the last slide, where India right here meets Nepal. Here's the Himalayas. All right, so you've got all this moist air here coming onto the land. Well, it'll rise up, and then it descends over on the opposite side of the Himalayas. On the opposite side of the Himalayas, right here, we've got the Gobi Desert in China. So we've got a major rain shadow effect there. Another place that this happens is Death Valley, California. Death Valley, California is completely a result of the rain shadow effect. All right, so let's talk about El Nino. El Nino, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, is a cyclical climate variation. It takes place in the tropical Pacific once every three to seven years, and it usually lasts for about a year. Under normal weather conditions, which is what you see up top, uh, trade winds move the warm surface waters of the Pacific away from the west coast of Central and South America. So you get this movement. You've got cooler water here, and it's being moved off the coast because of strong trade winds. As a result, the cold ocean water that lies under the displaced water moves to the surface and it brings nutrients with it and it keeps the temperature of the coastal water relatively cool. So it's called upwelling. So basically the winds come through and move this water here away and you've got, I'll show you a, a, a vertical column. So here is a vertical column of water. So up here the water tends to be warmer than it is down here. Well, if those strong trade winds move this water this way, this water here is going to rise up and take its place. Colder water tends to have more nutrients than warmer water does. So this cold, nutrient-rich water rises to the surface in a process, like I said before, called upwelling. That's a normal situation. So up here in this diagram is a normal situation. <clears throat> in an El Nino situation, what you have, the normal trade winds are either weakened or sometimes they're reversed because of a reversal of the high and low pressure regions on either side of the tropical Pacific. So normally we've got low pressure here, higher pressure here, these winds are going to blow strong from high to low. During an El Nino, this pressure here is actually going to increase, and this pressure here is going to decrease. So it's either going to cause these winds to be very, very gentle, or if this pressure over here increases enough to where it's uh, greater than the pressure over here, you're actually going to wind up seeing a reversal, and you're going to have this countercurrent that takes, takes over. So, the cold water, this warm water here, doesn't move off like it normally does. It does not do that. It winds up pooling here. So, the pooling of that water there, um, the process of upwelling either slows down or it stops. 
the water off the coast becomes warmer and it contains fewer nutrients. So during El Nino, the northern U.S. and Canada experience warmer winters and a less uh, intense hurricane season. The eastern U.S., regions of Peru, Ecuador, that are typically dry, have a higher than average rainfall. And the Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia are usually drier than normal. So an environmentally important effect of El Nino. Uh, because of the suppression of upwelling here off the coast of South America, the offshore fish populations of certain coastal areas wind up declining. So in countries like Peru, uh, which relies heavily on fishing, uh, El Nino can have really devastating economic effects. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, now the reverse of El Nino is known as La Nina. So the Coriolis effect contributes to La Nina conditions. So as air moves toward the equator to replace the rising hot air, the moving air deflects to the west and it helps move the surface water, allowing the upwelling. So during La Nina, the surface waters of the ocean that surround Central and South America, they're actually colder than normal. So finally, the alternations of these atmospheric conditions, um, you know, it, it's like El Nino happens every three to seven years, uh, usually lasts for, lasts for about a year. Um, La Nina, same deal, three to seven years, lasts about a year. Um, so basically, El Nino and La Nina, because they happen, um, it's basically them canceling each other out or, or, or equalizing things. I'm going to go ahead and stop this video right here, um, and I will pick up again in a minute.